A couple of months ago, I got an email from Adrian, who works for the channel How to Make Everything, a popular and really impressive YouTube channel. They do metal smelting, metal forging, tool making, food, textiles, woodwork. They they actually do everything. It's, it's not just a name. And Adrian said to me, hey, we're making a sign of our initials, H-T-M-E. And what we're gonna do is have a different YouTube maker do each one of the letters in a different style. So one of them's gonna be 3D printed, one of them's gonna be cast in bronze. We want you to do the hand tool woodworking letter. Are you interested? And I was like, hell yes, I'm interested. And he said, great sent me a drawing and I got to work. I made it, I boxed it up, I sent it to Adrian and it got stolen. Not misplaced or lost, it literally got stolen out of the mail. And for weeks we thought it was gone, I started on another one, it was a whole giant pain. And then, through a series of amazing coincidences, it got found and recovered and now Adrian's got it again and the project is moving forward, of course. I'm gonna tell you that whole story, but first, let's make it. This project is really different for me. It needs to be showy and have exposed joinery. My projects are usually simple and practical with hidden joinery. I am not the fancy dovetail guy, but so what? Maybe I've never been the fancy joinery guy because I've never tried. Let's give it a shot. The key to this project is stock preparation. Everything needs to be dimensioned precisely so the joints will be accurate and fit together cleanly. To get the most precision with hand tools, I'm working up to a series of layout lines. That means striking a line with a knife or marking gauge, sawing outside that line, and then slowly planing right up to my line, maybe even switching from a coarse plane to a finer one right at the end. By working slowly and using reference lines, your individual pieces can be incredibly straight and consistent. Anyone who says hand tools aren't accurate doesn't know what they're talking about. Okay. Here's the game plan. That piece of figured maple I've been working on will form the upright of the E. Then I'll make each of the horizontal pieces out of a contrasting wood. Each place where a horizontal joins the vertical, I'll make a different joint, picking the joints for looks more than strength. The finished piece will put those joints on display. For the horizontals, I'm using this gummy cherry. It's basically just cherry, but with veins of sap running through it. It also has some knots which we do not need. With all the pieces trimmed and square, it's time to get to work on the joinery. The top joint is going to be a bridle. It's a lot like a mortise and tenon, but it's open on three sides, so we'll get the visual effect of the cherry piece traveling straight through the maple. I'm going to cut a standard tenon and then trim it carefully down to my lines. Then I'll match that up to my vertical piece, saw down the lines, and knock out the waist. The fit is not great, and I need that tenon to be thinner without losing my precise straight lines. This is a perfect time to use a router plane. With the base of the tool registered against the stock, I can sweep the blade through long, even cuts, slowly paring off material while still keeping everything straight and parallel. Now the pieces fit nicely and it's on to the second joint. For the center joint, I've chosen a half lap dovetail. It's going to look nice and draw the eye to the middle of the piece. This is kind of like making a dovetail for furniture work. The angles can really be anything that looks good, but they need to be cut and trimmed very straight and square because we're going to mark the socket straight off the tail. Tracing it with a knife gives me absolute precision and I know exactly what waste needs to be removed. Just like a half blind drawer side, you can saw down part of the way, but the saw won't reach that inside corner. That's all chisel work. There's a lot of waste here, so I'm going to drill most of it out. Then I can chop in toward my layout lines and all the chips just collect in the middle. I work fast, getting rid of waste until I'm almost done. Then I drop my chisel right into my layout lines for a final careful cut. It's a nice fit. Okay, two of my joints are done, but I want that last one to be something really special, something you don't see every day. And I got the idea to do a 45 degree miter right at that lower corner, that would look cool. Of course, I don't wanna just take two 45 degree end grain pieces and glue them together. That probably wouldn't hold, especially over the long run. Much better thing to do would be to combine that 45 degree miter with the bridle joint that I cut on top and then kind of a half lap construction for added strength. Now, this isn't a joint that like exists. We're pretty much making it up. I think I should call it the mitered half bridle lap. 
That sounds good, right? This shot shows the layout. The joint will be the reverse of the first one I cut. I'll leave that center section and cut away the material to either side. On this last joint, I'm being really slow and careful. Messing up now would mean throwing away the whole vertical section and starting over. That would be awful. The horizontal piece is basically a mirror image of the joint I just cut. It's tricky, and the first one, well, it didn't work out. So here I am dimensioning another piece of cherry. I really should have prepped extra stock at the beginning, but I didn't think of it. The nice thing about making mistakes is they tell you what not to do. So my second time through, the joint was much smoother, and I'm slowly creeping up on a snug fit. Now, I'm not super used to doing fine work, and I wasn't very careful with my stock. It got pretty dented up while I was cutting the joints, and we need to do something about that before we assemble the piece. This piece took a lot of abuse from holdfasts, and the damage is pretty deep. A lot of the time, we just sand or plane away these defects, but when the wood is dented, all the material is still there. It's just been compressed. If we can make that wood expand, the dents will just go away. Here's a cool trick for that. Cover the wood with a damp paper towel, and then take a hot clothes iron and press it firmly to the work. The heat turns the water into steam, and the steam swells the fibers, making the dents disappear. Shout out to my first ever guitar teacher, Joe Prock, who showed me that trick when I was 17 years old, and it blew my mind. Joe also taught me how to repair guitars, which was one of the first experiences I ever had with woodworking. Good times. The glue up for this project is really straightforward. The joints fit tightly, so I don't need a lot of clamping. It's mostly just brushing glue inside the joints and pushing everything together. Easy. At this point, I like the piece very much. I especially like the way the lower two horizontals kind of extend into the vertical piece, with the miter here and the dovetail here. That makes the whole piece really hang together, and it's all integrated. The problem is the top piece doesn't do that. It extends through on the corner, you can see that, but right here it just sort of stops, and it doesn't give the whole thing the sense of unity and balance that I'm looking for. I need some way for this piece to extend into the vertical, and what I came up with was pinning the joint, just taking a wooden peg or dowel and putting it right in there. And what I can do to keep the whole color scheme intact is just cut a custom dowel out of this cherry. Over at the lathe, I've got a piece of gummy cherry, and I'm just going to turn it round. I need a really exact diameter for this peg, so I'm going to use a parting tool along with a set of calipers. You hold both tools against the wood until the calipers just slide into the work. Now that I have two perfect diameters, I turn away the waste in between them, straighten things up, and double check my diameter. Now I've got a perfect little custom dowel. I need a clean hole with a crisp edge for the installation, so I'm using a Forstner bit with the drill at full speed. The peg goes in with a bit of glue, I flush cut it, and then I'm going to trim it with a chisel. You can get a perfect finish straight off the tool if you sweep your way across that end grain, taking little bites with the corner of the tool. All the corners of the piece need to be radiused, and I do that with a metal file. It's slow, but it leaves a nice finish, and there's no risk of tearing the wood. Now, it's just finishing. To smooth it out, I'm going with a card scraper. I've got wood going in a bunch of different directions, and planing this would be risky. Scrapers are slower, but they don't tear out, and they don't really care about grain direction. Then, I sanded the piece with several grits, going all the way up to 400. I don't usually sand my projects, but for this one, it was the best solution. Now, I can't do the finishing where I just did all of that dusty sanding. I need a clean space with plenty of room for supplies. I'm going to go over to my new workbench. We made the rear tool well convertible, so you can just flip it over and get a big, flat work surface. I want the piece up off the bench, and I want access to the edges, so I'm going to use these little finishing stands. They're just bolts driven through scrap wood with the points filed off. My finish is shellac out of the can, and I'm applying it with a cloth rag. I do two coats with a light sanding in between, and I rub out the final finish with paste wax on steel wool. After that, it's time to just see how it came out. After I said yes to this project, I procrastinated a lot. I didn't feel confident doing this fancy, precise kind of work. I couldn't help thinking I was just the wrong guy for this. I mean, Rob Cosman or Matt Eslea, those guys would be much better for this. But then I thought, it really doesn't matter who the best person would be. I'm the one who got the call. A big, 
popular channel picked me to do the woodwork for their sign. My job is not to talk them out of it. My job is to get it done and make it good. So I pushed myself to work more slowly and carefully and turn out something I could be proud of. And you know, maybe somebody else could have done a better job than me, but that doesn't really matter because I did a pretty good job. It's not perfect, but nothing ever is. You can waste your life nitpicking your own work, or you can just take a win once in a while. So the finished drive, I boxed it up, put it in the mail, and forgot about it. It was December, the holidays, everything like that. Along in January, I thought to myself, hey, I wonder what they think of the E. So I emailed Adrian and I said, hey, how did you like it? And Adrian said, how did we like what? We never got anything from you. And of course, I completely freaked out and there was a flurry of activity, tracking numbers, emails, trying to figure out what was going on. Eventually, Adrian found this photograph, helpfully taken by another carrier. And you can see that little square depression in the snow in the corner of Adrian's back porch. Yeah, that's where my package was right before some piece of garbage stole it off the porch and made off with it. This was an enormous bummer. We waited a few days, nothing happened, it didn't resurface, and Adrian says to me, listen, this really sucks, but can you make another one? And I was like, um, I would rather not. It was kind of a project, and I'm onto other things, I don't really have the time, but I thought, they don't have a sign if I don't do this. Like, I said I was gonna do it, and it's not their fault that it got stolen, so, Okay, and I got to work making another one, and I was 99% done with it. This is the replacement. This is the second one. I get another email from Adrian, and inside that email is this. Okay, so apparently what happened is this nice young lady lives in Adrian's neighborhood, came home from work one night, and the E was just like sitting against her back door. Unboxed, just sitting there. And she thought to herself, gee, that's weird, that's not mine but I'm sure somebody cares about it. So she helpfully took it inside and just held on to it. This whole time, Adrian is flooding social media with appeals. Hey, have you guys seen this? Has anybody in the neighborhood seen a box or seen this big E? I'm really looking for it. And eventually this girl sees that and thinks, oh, that's in my kitchen. I guess I better get it back to its rightful owner. She does, Adrian picks it up. It's in perfect condition. It's going in the sign. <laughs> We have a happy ending. It's unbelievable. So there is going to be an amazing video from How to Make Everything about the entire sign. It's a whole huge production. It involves like six different creators, a bunch of different processes. My whole little odyssey is just one tiny part of the story. It's gonna be amazing. If you haven't so far, subscribe to the channel How to Make Everything. They're wonderful, I've been following them for years. Tragically, they recently just had a big fire and lost most of their stuff, they've got videos about that, they've got a GoFundMe, you can throw in a couple bucks and help them rebuild. I'm gonna do that because they're a great channel and I want them to succeed and overcome this really difficult situation. If you happen to need a workbench, I've got my quick stack bench, which breaks down into six convenient pieces and has that flippable tool well I was showing off earlier in the video. We've got plans and a course to help you through that build and you can grab those over at rexkruger.com store. Just like always, these videos would never be possible without my patrons on Patreon. If you'd like to be one of those people, go on over to patreon.com slash Rex Kruger and check out all the rewards and extras we have for the people who make these videos possible. <gasps> wow, that was a lot. It's been, it's been a rough couple of weeks. <laughs> Thanks for watching.